Thank you for joining us today for our Building Healthy Relationships Professionally and Personally with One Foundation Wealth, One Love Foundation, I'm sorry about that, uh, with Jeff Lamberg. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsors, our professional development sponsors, William James College and InSource Services for helping making this event possible. Um, I'd like to pass it over to Jeff. I, I think this is a great topic. Um, I think as adults, we want to keep learning to build healthy relationships. So I'm really intrigued on what you have to teach us. So I'll pass it over to you, Jeff. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I believe um, some more will be popping on soon. I know the weather is not great as I look out my side window um, here. And I saw somebody driving, so be careful as you're driving. Uh, so um, I am going to share my screen. There we go. Um, so quick introduction. Um, so my name is uh, Jeff Lemberg. I'm a director at One Love Boston. Um, and I'll explain One Love in a bit. Um, my background, um, as I was telling Maxim, is... Um, so first part of my career was actually in journalism, and the second part of my career uh, was in uh, higher education. And so I was a professor of media studies uh, with a specialty in organizational change um, and organizational leadership, uh, particularly at mission-driven organizations. Um, the third part of my career is now around nonprofit leadership, um, specifically in the education space. Um, and so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here with you all uh, to talk about um, One Love and our work in general, and then uh, pivoting a bit to uh, how it translates to the workplace um, and all of you. Uh, and so I'd love to, just as a quick icebreaker, and this gets into our bigger thing of talk later, is... Um, you know, when you're in the office, and I know a lot of us work from home these days, but when you are in the office, um, who do you prefer to eat lunch with? Do you prefer, and you can put this in the chat, uh, a small group of colleagues with just one of your colleagues uh, or by yourself? And there's no wrong answer, obviously, but um, as we talk about um, relationships uh, in the workplace, it's an interesting kind of uh, question. So if you can throw that in the chat. And so, um, small group of colleagues, a small group, uh, also a small group, small group or by yourself. That's great. Um, you know, me in general, I'm a by myself. It, it's uh, I'm a recharger kind of in many ways. So a lot of us, I'm sure, over the point of our career has done a Meyer Briggs kind of thing. And, and I'm fall on the introvert spectrum where um, I get my energy a little bit from solitude um, and then re-engaging. So it really depends on how much we're spending time with people in the workplace. Um, but these are also great opportunities to get to know your colleagues. And so we'll talk a little bit about that because it really is the underpinning of the relationships we have with them. So about One Love. Um, so we are a national nonprofit organization and our mission is to end relationship abuse, uh, primarily by teaching young people, that's from middle school through college, how to identify the signs of healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviors. Uh, we do this a few different ways, but we primarily provide free trainings to educators and other adults to help build the capacity of schools, uh, youth services organizations, nonprofits, and, and for-profit companies uh, to provide high-quality relationship health education. Um, we have a team of staff educators that go out to schools and run our workshops to middle school and high school students and college students, um, and we also do a lot of training uh, in person and virtually of adults um, to help them build the capacity so that they can provide kind of high quality evidence-based relationship health curriculum. Um, One Love is founded uh, in 2014 officially 
um, but it was also founded out of a tragedy. So there was a young woman named Yardley Love who was a student at the University of Virginia uh, who was murdered by her ex-boyfriend. Uh, over the course of that criminal trial, the Love family came to realize that uh, Yardley had long been in danger, but they really didn't understand the warning signs of that danger in, in real time, and neither did many of the people around Yardley. And so what they came to appreciate was that if people had understood that better, um, her death could have you know, possibly been prevented. And so they developed this nonprofit uh, aimed as a primary prevention tool to educate young people to identify the signs of healthy and unhealthy relationship behaviors. Um, our first educational workshops began in 2014. Uh, we launched here uh, in the, the Boston area in 2017, um, but we are now a national organization. We have five uh, offices, um, largely in the coast, so I help run New England, but we have a tri-state region uh, we have Mid-Atlantic region, uh, we have a California region and a Pacific Northwest. Uh, the rest of the country we handle virtually, so we have a team, our headquarters is in New York. Um, I'm in, our, my team is here in Boston area. I'm in Newton, actually, right now. Um, and um, the regional team, or the, the team that handles the country is all virtually, and so we do a lot of virtual trainings now as a result. So why is this uh, important, um, you know, beyond the obvious? So nearly one and a half million high school students experience physical abuse from a dating partner every year. Um, you know, that is 10% of the U.S. high school population. Um, so that's one and a half million high school kids every year are experiencing physical abuse. Uh, one in four teens are reporting being abused or harassed by their partner online or through texts or DMs. Um, and that number is, you know, has steadily been increasing over the years as more and more young people are owning their own devices, are um, involved in multiplayer video games and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then here in Massachusetts, more than 20 percent of high school students reported that someone they were dating monitored their personal activities over the previous 12 months. Um, we know from research that, you know, such stalking behavior is an early warning sign of um, bigger problems down the road. Um, and so this is self-reported. And so what, what we know from self-reported surveys um, is usually the number is much higher. Uh, on a national basis, um, you know, one in two trans and non-binary people have experienced some form of intimate partner violence during their lifetime. Um, it's more than one in three women uh, and nearly one in three men. When we say intimate partner violence, just so that we're, we're talking about the same thing, we're really, it means, you know, an interpersonal relationship, so two people in which there is physical or emotional intimacy. Uh, legally, when we talk about intimate partner violence or intimate partners, you know, it is, um, you know, a married couple, a couple that had previously been married, could be uh, two people who are living together. Uh, in a dating relationship. It could just be dating relationship. Um, and so it is pervasive. And when we talk about uh, violence, um, it is, you know, on the extreme end, you know, sexual and physical. Um, but we're also talking about phys uh, emotional abuse, as well as financial abuse, which, which gets into control and other elements. Um, you know, one love, I would argue, matters immensely for the bottom number that only you know a third of the teens who were ever in abusive relationship ever told anybody about it and so really one of the things that we try to do a lot of is teaching the language around these behaviors because once you can name it uh, you can do something about it and so we really want to destigmatize um relationships they're not taught really in school they're really not taught at home by and large um, and so quite often what we're doing is unteaching, you know, what kids are learning through popular culture media and trying to help them understand what healthy relationships um, tend to look like and being able to give them the tools if they are in a healthy, unhealthy relationship to, um, to understand that, to get out of it, to help somebody else who they see is in one uh, and to live a healthier, happier and, and safer life. 
uh, why does this matter in, in the bigger picture? So research you know, consistently shows that uh, harmful relationships are both the cause and consequence of many negative health outcomes. Um, that is, you know, mental health, our physical health, uh, as well as an array of social outcomes um, that include employability, housing security, uh, incarceration rates as well. Um, and this translates in many ways too. So in the workplace, it was recently a study that got some attention. I think Fortune Magazine wrote about it that 70% uh, of respondents in a pretty large survey that spanned, I think, some 10 countries said that their manager has as much influence on their mental health as their partner at home, and more so than their doctor or their therapist. So the role of a manager in shaping one's mental health um, is significant. And, and as a result of that, we see, um, you know, that has consequences in terms of productivity, consequences in retention, consequences in a whole number of other factors that go beyond the workplace and, and it seeps into one's life. Um, and so we talk about relationships. Uh, we're really talking about all encompassing everything. Um, at One Love, because we work with young people uh, as young as 10 uh, in middle school, you know, we're really focusing on friendships uh, and, and just that interpersonal closeness. Um, we also talking about dating relationships. We also talk about intimate partner relationships. We're also talking about family members, teammates, classmates, uh, and coworkers. So we look at relationships broadly. The bulk of our work is with schools, is with students, um, and, and quite often it is around dating relationships. But uh, our curriculum is staged by age, and so the younger kids are really talking about healthy relationships. Um, understanding identity, understanding, um, you know, you see it for anybody who's, who's had children, you know, we see that the gentrification of it, you know, this idea of like, you know, I have two daughters. So I have a daughter who's a high school sophomore and a daughter who's a sixth grader, uh, both in, in Newton Public Schools. You know, when they were in first or second, when they were in kindergarten, first grade, they had lots of friends of both genders. And once you hit first, second grade, all the birthday parties become single gender uh, in many ways. And so, you know, we talk a lot about just what does it mean to be a good friend? What does it mean to engage um, with the younger kids? And then as they get older, we get into um, some of the more intimate partner dating relationships. So how do we go about it? Um, so videos play a big role in our work. So we have 17 different workshops that all show uh, original. We've produced all of these uh, narrative, uh, fictional relationship that has gone awry. And they're all different types of relationships. Each video is about 10 minutes in length. Um, and that's the launching off point for discussion. So our educators lead a moderated discussion with students around some of the issues that they've seen, identifying healthy behaviors and unhealthy behaviors. Uh, students are learning about active bystander. So when you see something, how do you intervene in, in a safe way? What are the words that you can use to uh, lower the pressure in, in a situation? Um, and there's lots of other materials that we share and otherwise. Um, again, we'll go into schools and, and we'll run these workshops. We'll go into nonprofits. We work with a lot of domestic violence agencies uh, throughout the area, a lot of youth serving nonprofits throughout the area. And we'll run our workshops and trainings, um, you know, either directly or indirectly by training their educators to use our stuff. The Online Education Center, so you can go to our website, which is uh, joinonelove.org, um, and you can just register free of charge and um, go through one of our trainings. And it's about an hour in length, and you really learn how to go. And there's 17 different trainings because each workshop's a little bit different. Um, and learn how to use the discussion guide, how to facilitate a conversation. You know, if the conversation starts getting challenging emotionally or what have you, you know, how to deal with that. So not everybody obviously has an education background or a teaching background, should I say. Um, and so we're really training any trusted adult um, to be able to go through this or even students to go through our training to then bring it um, to either an individual like a child at home or it could be a small group 
We have a lot of folks who are youth coaches who feel the um, desire to bring this in and, and use this for their whole team. Um, others who do it for church groups or synagogues or what have you. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a free resource. All of our educational materials are provided free. So we don't charge any school. We don't charge any nonprofit. Um, and all of this is available for free. Uh, we believe deeply in equity. Uh, and equity means access um, in this case. And so um, this is the other way that we really kind of spread the message um, and try to reach capacity in many ways. So the 10 signs um, are kind of the foundation of what we do. And these are our, our um, signature 10 signs. So 10 signs of healthy relationships, 10 signs of unhealthy relationships, uh, intensity, possessiveness, uh, betrayal, isolation. I, I won't read them all. Um, but we use these as kind of the, the touchstone for all of the work that we do uh, to help young people, again, put words to actions in many ways um, so that they can understand what's going on. Um, and, and I'm going to show you a, a quick video. So last year, we launched three different uh, PSAs, uh, two in October, which was Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and then one in just this past February, which is Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month. Uh, the theme for us was around digital abuse. So uh, as parents, you know, one of the more concerning things is um, what your kid is doing in their bedroom on their phone, you can't see. You, you can't see what's happening quite often. You might overhear it on a video game or something, but by and large, you can't really see it. And so being able to um, help facilitate some of conversations so this is one of uh, the PSAs, our most recent PSA. Why can't I be here? I'm with my friends. You're not your friends. How did you even know I was here? Your location, obviously. I'm just having fun. No, you're just desperate for attention. You're leaving. Even when they happen on your phone, unhealthy behaviors can still hurt. Learn the signs before things go too far. Visit joinonelove.org. So for us, the, the pull is a lot of what we do. So we, we try to put stuff out there, pull people to our website where we have all of these resources um, to help them. Um, and then hopefully we can go deeper in that. So I would go back and say, uh, and open it up at this point. Um, what were some of the behaviors that you heard the guy who really was just texting it all, but what were some of the unhealthy uh, signs that you heard? Um, and, and I think, you know, folks can either take themselves off mute and, and throw it out there, or you can put it in the chat, whatever you're more comfortable with. Uh, we're a small enough group, I, I think, where people can kind of jump in as they want. Um, what do you think? What are some of the... Um, unhealthy relationship signs that you saw. Hi, how are you? Hi. Oh, hi, how are you? This is Melissa Madden. Um, yeah, so one of the things I first recognized was that was her father, correct? No, that was a boyfriend. So. Um, okay. So when he mentioned you're just looking for attention, but she's just sitting there alone in the corner and that definitely belittling her and isolating her. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This is a boyfriend and all of our PSAs tend to be uh, around that relationship um, between, you know, two uh, partners in many ways. So yeah, absolutely. What else? Um, there were some other things in there. Folks can take themselves off mute and, and just call I, it out. Um, yeah, I actually, the locating, you know, like location, knowing exactly where she was um, and then asking her why she was there. I actually thought it was apparent at first too, but mm. then as the conversation went on, figured it wasn't, but you know, the tracking the location or, you know, why are you there? Yeah. Yeah. And so we, you know, we would put that under possessiveness in many ways, you know, obviously like when you're tracking location, you know, there's a degree of stalkerness. Um, you know, those of us who have kids, um, you know, we have certainly done that, you know, being able to track kind of where they are a little bit, um, but there is a difference when you're a high school student and your partner is doing that. Um, that is certainly troubling in different ways. Uh, anything else? There's a, certainly a few other things. Yeah, I just want to introduce myself. I'm Alan Katz. Uh, 
I want, I'm a real estate officer here in Auburndale. I want to expand all services, real estate, venture capital, stocks, crypto, consulting, investment banking. It's a small firm right now with five people. Uh, my stock will go to the moon. Anyone who wants to buy the work for me gets free stock. Uh, uh, in terms of relationships, I'm getting a divorce and uh, I'm just hoping to meet new people. I want to take things really slow, get me friends first, and uh, no hurry to get married again for, for a oh, long time. I want to enjoy being Alan, single. sorry, sorry to interrupt. Do you do you have the answer to his question though? What's his question? Um, <laughs> the talking... question is: Did you notice anything in the video that um, you thought you know from an unhealthy relationship perspective? I was I'm sorry. I, I wasn't. I didn't see the video. I, I would just see. The, I just see the how healthy and unhealthy relationships and everything. Okay, maybe you I just. Think, I think the most yeah. important thing is the comfortable pace. That's the most important thing to me. The healthy yeah. relationship, the comfortable pace, not to go too fast. That's the most important thing to me. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so jump in. Uh, one of the last things on this is, is so our we have a student leadership program. So in addition to the direct education that we provide um, to students, we have a year long student leadership program where they're learning um, communication skills, advocacy skills, uh, self and social advocacy. Um, rallying skills. Uh, and so we have this here in uh, the greater Boston uh, area. So we have 52 students, high school and college students throughout the area. Um, you know, the one bef ahead of the state house, that's the California state house. So that's uh, the team out in uh, Los Angeles um, who then went out to Sacramento. Um, we're doing some stuff around teen dating violence awareness month and talking to legislators and so it's a fantastic program here in Boston, uh, in the Boston area. We have this uh, wonderful young woman named Leela Rajiv, who is our uh, student leadership coordinator, who kind of runs that uh, program. Uh, and so if uh, anybody has high school or college students who might have an interest in this, um, by all means, you can get in touch with me. And uh, it's a great program. It's a rolling program as well, um, you know, to help young people, again, take ownership of this idea. Um, and, and quite often they are running workshops for middle school kids. They're running workshops through community groups that they're affiliated with. Um, and so it's another way that we're able to engage uh, young people. Uh, regionally, uh, One Love Boston serves uh, more than 30,000 young people throughout New England. Uh, and, and to date, you know, that's 130 different high schools. That's public, charter, and private as well as 90 different colleges and universities uh, throughout New England. There's a lot, obviously, out here. Uh, and 75 different nonprofits and governmental organizations. We do a lot of work with boys and girls clubs, YMCAs, um, and, and other youth-serving uh, groups as well. Nationally, um, so we've been uh, doing this work, again, since two, 2014. Uh, we've served more than 2.2 million uh, people to date. Uh, we've trained more than 42,000 individuals to run our workshops uh, in different ways. So that's either live trainings or through uh, the online training center. Um, more than 1,200 schools and uh, nearly 1,200 community organizations, again, nationwide. Um, and we're currently actually doing some work on the ground now in Dallas, uh, in the greater, I think, Phoenix area, as well as Philadelphia. So we're experimenting with being able to do something with a small footprint in each of those communities. So I would love to show you a sample of a video um, of one of the videos that we have. Um, this is called Behind the Post. And uh, it's a 10 minute video. I'm only gonna show you about a minute of it, uh, but the essence of this is, um, you know, quite often in a relationship, particularly a young person's relationship, how people see that relationship through social media influences a person's desire to stay in it or not. And so, you know, for any of us who are on social media, whether it's Facebook or what have you, um, you know, we curate our images, right? We, we never show ourselves in the worst of our situations. We show ourselves in the best of situations and relationships are the same, but behind the scenes, you know, not all things are great all the time. Um, and, and so there is that external pressure that others who see our relationships online uh, put on it. 
Um, and so I'm going to pull this up. Oops. Take a second, sorry. one of the challenges we have is because we keep everything behind the wall until you register, um, you know, we want to be able to know when people are on the video or using our videos. So it's not so easy all the time to pull out uh, your screen. Nice. What? I don't know. <laughs> Phones read. No, it's fine. Hi. <laughs> Still ringing. You don't want to get it? What if it's an emergency or something? No, it's probably just a friend. It's just a friend? Yeah, All right, then pick it up and show me. Is it the guy who is it who I think it is? If it's, if it's who I think it is, he wants one thing and you're you're too foolish to even realize why he's calling you right now at 11 30 p.m. at night because it's your friend. Sorry. A drunk. I was stupid. You're not hiding something. Let me see the phone. Calm down. Yeah, I'm going to see it. I just want to look at your phone. Just let me look at your phone. Tell me for So um, it ends up going on from there. Um, and what I would love to do is to bring it back. So again, I would bring it back to this and say, what unhealthy relationships did you see? Uh, again, I, I showed you a minute and a half of what was a, a 10, 12 minute video. Um, so you only saw you know, a small piece of it, but what were some examples of things that you saw that um, indicated signs of unhealthy behaviors? So um, see from Melissa, anger and controlling behavior. Um, there's a lack of trust, absolutely. Intensity. Uh, intensity, for sure. Definitely the and, use of no trust. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, verbal abuse in many ways, absolutely. Um, you know, and these are all great. And, and these aren't even the terms that we use quite often, but, you know, they show up in different ways, right? Um, and so volatility you know whether it's kind of the verbal aggression or in some case even the physical aggression where it starts building up in many ways um there is a degree of belittling where he's like you know if you're you know too stupid to understand what he really wants or you know again assuming that he's even right uh about it um in terms of what's going on um deflecting responsibility even you know to some degree so you know what we often talk about is um you know 
his insecurity is quite often um, the reason behind his actions. Uh, and what we often will say to students that we're working with is, no matter what she did or didn't do in this scenario that might have triggered him, um, that's still no justification for his actions, right? So he's responsible for his actions in this case. Um, and, and early on in the video, you actually see where they're together and he has to head off to work and she's you know, guilting him and preventing him from leaving. And so it, originally you think she's the one who's actually um, the perpetrator of the unhealthy relationships. And, and, you know, in a small degree she is, but he is, you know, far, far worse in, in many ways. Um, and so it's just a small example of kind of the work that we do. Um, and we, you know, again, we'll bring students up front and, you know, work on like, if you saw such an example, and there was another example in the video um, where uh, her friends could have intervened, they were at the party and could have stepped in and tried to um, move him away safely, move her away safely, done some things. Um, you know, how do you go about doing that? Um, more often than not, people are uncomfortable by uncomfortable situations, and they tend not to do a whole lot. Um, and so this is something that we are looking to take action, you know, and, and help young people learn how to take action uh, safely in many ways. So with that, um, pivoting a bit here to healthy workplace relationships, um, because as I said, when we talk about relationships, we talk about it, everything from friendship to dating to intimate partner to the relationships we have with our colleagues. Um, you know, it is for many of us, half of our waking hours, five days of the week that we're uh, with our colleagues or interacting directly with our colleagues. Um, and it's a really big deal. And it's become even a bigger deal in terms of these relationships over the last three years um, since we, you know, so many of us are increasingly working remotely, uh, our teams are working remotely, we're using digital media quite often um, to communicate as opposed to when we're all in the office together. Uh, one of the things that's really helpful and, and a lot of what we talk about is just understanding um, when we think about the relationships we have with colleagues, it really does boil down to understanding. And so, just kind of shows current US workforce numbers um, and how people fall in them from a generational standpoint. Uh, intergenerational challenges are, are certainly a, a major problem. Um, and I don't know that's a new problem, but it is certainly still a problem. Um, so Generation X, which I am in, uh, millennials, um, you know, are, you know, well over two thirds or about a little more than two thirds of the workforce in general. Um, Generation Z is just coming into the workforce. Um, and there is an appreciation that, you know, if you are a millennial, there is a huge difference between a 23 year old who is only a few years removed from college and a 42 year old. Um, quite often what we're really talking about is life stage. Um, and where you are in your career and where you are and, and what's going on. But it is helpful to just kind of understand the landscape uh, in this way. Um, I'm show you a, a good funny video um, of some of the divide between uh, a millennial and a baby boomer. Did I get the job? Absolutely not. Why not? Because you're a baby boomer and I'm a millennial. Ah, well, Melanie. I, I am overqualified for this job. I don't know where you got this. We don't do paper applications. I made it. I don't do the internet. Okay, that is the third time you have said that this interview, and it also says so on this homemade job application. There you go, champ. I don't know what this is for. Uh, don't you need a trophy anytime you anything? <laughs> Oh, it's all good. How'd you get here? Horse? Uh, I drove my car. I own it. After eight more payments. How'd you get here? I took an Uber. You do not know what that is. <laughs> I bet you're a vegan. Yeah, because I'm not a monster. 
Your generation is afraid of black people. Your generation thinks you are black people. Oh, word. Uh, Look at who you guys voted for. Yeah, that's right. I voted. Who shall I? This is the only way you'll ever own a house. Learning how to text is the only way you'll ever communicate with your son. All right, guys, who took my share of the pro album? Gen X. Uh, you know what? You're hired. I quit. Dad? Uh, so it's a great video uh, that. Uh, shows a little bit of the kind of the funny touch uh, of it all. Um, so communication style. So research has shown a little bit around how different generations prefer to communicate. Um, so starting from the bottom, you know, the youngest generation uh, is much more comfortable digitally um, through messaging, text, social media, uh, et cetera. Um, I mentioned uh, at the onset that I uh, used to be a college professor and it it always stunned me um, that, you know, trying to have face-to-face -face conversations with um, students was really a challenge in many ways. They, you know, actually wanted me to text them. Um, and, and so it was even pulling them into email what was to some degree uh, a bit of a lift. Uh, millennials, again, um, younger, but um, messaging, text, email uh, as well. Generation X and baby boomers uh, is really, you know, whatever is most efficient, um, but including phone calls and face-to-face. -face. Uh, I'm a big fan of picking up the phone and, and calling somebody uh, if need be. Um, you know, my children are mortified by that um, idea of picking up the phone and, and calling somebody. It almost feels like an invasion, um, you know, of, of somebody's privacy. So again, it's useful to just understand, um, broadly speaking, kind of where somebody is coming from. Um, life stage, uh, things in, thinking about professional motivation. So the same research you know, asked um, how they view the workplace. Uh, again, Generation Z, so these are folks who are you know, a couple of years out of college. Um, you know, individuality, creativity, um, identity plays a really big role and kind of how they want to be seen and treated and understood in the workplace. Uh, for millennials, again, that's, you know, early 20s uh, to, you know, early 40s. Um, responsibility, the quality of the manager uh, and unique work experiences matter tremendously. We see a lot of turnover, um, you know, among that kind of millennial stage. Um, the adage is, you know, people don't quit jobs, they quit bad managers, you know, frankly. Um, and so uh, these are folks who, you know, by and large are more than happy to leave. And in this economy, will have a lot of opportunities to leave um, if they don't feel like they're getting what they want. Um, and, you know, quite often they, they want a lot of responsibility and, you know, that's a good thing. Generation X, again, speaks to life stage. So work-life balance, personal and professional interests, head of the company, uh, you know, on the younger end of that Generation X spectrum. Um, it is about, you know, getting to the place of kind of personal happiness, as opposed to like, I'm working for the company that, and I really deeply care about the company more than my own personal interests. Um, you know, baby boomers, as you know, that's a little bit more of company loyalty and duty to the job. Uh, my folks are in their 80s and, and have been long retired, but um, we always joked that like they would stay in their job until they were just forced out the door. Um, you know, they were loyal to the core um, and they grew up in that time, right? So they grew up in the time where if you have a good job, you're going to stay in that job. And even if you're not particularly happy in that position, you'll stay in it. Um, and so again, understanding why somebody is at work, why somebody uh, and how somebody is motivated by the work really shapes your understanding of them. Um, 
and you know how you view them as your partner and, and a colleague. So with that, I, again, we'll go back to the unhealthy and healthy signs. Um, you know, from a healthy relationship standpoint, you know, there's some clear things that really we would value from a colleague or from a manager, you know, which again is a colleague. Um, trust, honesty, you know, sometimes there's honesty to a fault, but there's honesty. Uh, independence, you know, being able to work on things on your own without being micromanaged. Um, respect, obviously. Um, equality is probably one of the hardest ones. So organizations, generally speaking, are hierarchical, right? So there are managers and those managers have managers. And even though a lot of companies will have an open door policy, um, you know, the reality is there is a chain of command. Um, and so if you have an issue, you're going to take it up with your immediate manager. And so that does make equality uh, quite challenging, particularly for younger generations who, who believe that uh, individuality and equality are central um, to their sense of belonging. Um, that's a you know a bit of a challenge, I think, that needs to be overcome. And there's things that companies can do to bolster uh, equality, given the hierarchical structure that exists organizationally. Um, but it's a challenge. Um, fun, hugely important. Um, we just recently did a retreat. So like a afternoon out, we went to South Boston. We did a dumpling making workshop um, at a place called May May. It's a great place. Um, and then afterwards, we went to Somerville to a, an axe throwing bar. So it was a bar where you literally, they give you axes and you're throwing it at a target. Um, in those four hours, I got to know my colleagues so much better than I have uh, in the previous um, you know, months and you know what have you. So there is a lot to be said for fun. What I would open it up again to around the unhealthy relationships is what are things that you've experienced? Um, we don't want to say for current jobs, maybe but we'll just say in a job you've had and whether that encompasses your current job or not, we'll leave that out. But like in, in your experience as a professional, what are some unhealthy things that you've experienced um, with a colleague in any way? Uh, and so I think maybe folks can throw it in the chat or um, if you want to uh, jump off mute and share out. And I'd say, you know, again, coming, you know, having spent a chunk of time in academia, I don't know if anybody else has ever worked in academia. It's, it's one of the more toxic environments, in part because most people are tenured. And so when you're not worried about job security, you, you can be as, as awful as you choose to be. Um, and so how people talk to each other was, it was stunning uh, in, in many ways. Um, so for the chat, uh, competition amongst each other. Thank you, Kate. Um, certainly is, is a part of it. Um, and even if we're using unhealthy relationships, like what are the other things that we see uh, among colleagues? I would definitely say the uh, competition amongst each other. I did work for a company recently that they pitted us against each other. Even though we all had the same goal in mind, they pitted us against each other to see who could have the top number. Yeah. And it, it, they would have been much more successful if they said, okay, here's your region, here's your region, here's your region. Okay, let's go out and have an internal competition of who can get the most, not pit us against. So if you suck, your job's out. Yeah, yeah. You know, motivation instead of diminishing what you have already accomplished. Sure. I Thanks. mean, then again, I had my old boss that would take a hundred dollar bill and pin it to my cubicle and go, hey, give me five referrals this week and that hundred bucks is yours. I was like, bam, here you go. Give me my money. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so motivation, thank you for that. Uh, motivation, um, you know, comes in a lot of shapes and, and forms. Um, and, and it's important to understand that, you know, not everybody is competitive. Um, and, you know, some people don't need competition to be motivated to do their best at work. Um, you know, and some might say, you know, there is a manipulation aspect to, to what you were just talking about there of how to kind of goose people in a certain way. Um, you know, a lot of workplaces, you know, what you see is um, belittling 
you know, behind your, you know, people's backs, um, a lot of gossiping and what have you. And, and I think most people are guilty of that. Um, you know, one of the things that we often say at One Love is, um, you know, this work is important because everybody is either in a relationship of some kind or another, um, and everybody is guilty of doing some unhealthy things, right? And so, you know, who amongst us hasn't ever deflected responsibility, you know, at some point in a relationship that we've had, um, whether that's with a partner or a colleague, who amongst us has not guilted somebody um, to kind of get something that you're trying to get? Um, who amongst us has not been a little bit possessive or perhaps inappropriately intense over something? Uh, and so this isn't to brand the individual. It really is to brand the I, the behavior. Um, and to say that these are all works in progress. Um, but, you know, when we're talking about relationships, um, you know, they're the seeds of things that sometimes can, can get really unhealthy. And we want people to be able to identify it. Um, to be able to act on healthier versions of that. Um, so rooted in honesty, rooted in kindness, rooted in fun, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I just wanted to say that I'm really enjoying this group. Uh, my biggest task is to find 60 people to work for me, top-notch professionals, real estate, securities, venture capital, whatever. And the most important thing to me is honesty. I really want to hire honest, righteous people working for me. The kingdom of heaven says that the righteous will inherit the earth and become wealthy and inherit everything. I don't want wicked people working for me. They don't deserve it. And if I can have a good reputation for my firm and only hire good, righteous people, then we'll, we'll earn a reputation. We'll make money for our clients and we'll earn a lot of business. Yeah. And that's the most thank important you. thing to me. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I think there, there's not a lot of uh, companies that are doing really well by um, having employees who are doing unhealthy things and have unhealthy relationships with each other uh, in general. Um, you know, important to understand the role of digital media in the workplace and kind of how we use it uh, and how others are using it in many ways. Um, you know, it has certainly evolved over the last 30 years, right? So from, you know, pagers to email, from, you know, email to Blackberries, you know, there's always a thing of like, tell me how old you are without telling me how old you are. And I say, you know, Blackberries, you know, that, you know, those of us who had Blackberries in the day and, you know, them around, um, you know, our mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, messaging systems, you know, internally like Slack um, are great in many ways. So you can, there's a little bit more immediacy. You know, the downside is quite often there are channels that are based on kind of the groups that you work in. And so, you know, while that helps in terms of projects in many cases, it also solidifies silos. Um, and so that is a potential danger in terms of uh, healthy workplace relationships. Uh, email, again, who amongst us has not ever uh, written something that was perhaps taken the wrong way because it lacked clarity or lacked emotion or lacked um, some aspect that somebody took it out of context. Uh, and so email, again, is good and you know not so good sometimes, as well as Zoom. So we spend a lot of time on Zoom, obviously. Um, you know, these are nice in that they're pre-planned. Um, not so great in that, you know, it's easy to get personally distracted, right? So who amongst us within this hour has not multitasked, right? Like, and so it's a lot harder, I think, you know, when you are face to face to be multitasking. Uh, in some way, and, and to um, you know, to be more present, uh, and so in any relationship, being present uh, is certainly uh, incredibly important. Uh, and digital technology is one of the things that allows us, um, you know, perhaps not to be uh, in, in some ways. And so, again, this isn't to say any things are good or any things are fully bad. It really is awareness about how the tools affect the relationships we have um, and how we're able to kind of tweak our behaviors um, to have better relationships. Um, and maybe that is for the person who likes to have lunch alone, 
to be able to spend some more time with a colleague rather than having a Zoom meeting, meeting up if you are working remotely, meeting up uh, in person uh, at a coffee shop if you know that's something or um, you know face to face around the office if possible. Um, and, and so three elements of improvement to be aware of in general, um, grace, communication, and humanity. So grace is, you know, really just not thinking the worst of somebody's motives. You know, quite often we think about unhealthy relationships. You know, we apply motives to a lot of people's communication or their behaviors. Um, and we often don't know. And so it really is thinking the, um, you know, giving people the benefit of the doubt uh, more often than not. Uh, direct communication, it's about thinking about the questions that you're asking of people. Um, the answers you give to people, uh, your tone, your body language, uh, all of these things really matter. Um, and to be mindful of it in many ways. Uh, you know, I, as somebody who comes from journalism, who comes from academia, these are worlds where it's a little more direct in our communication. You know, it's, it's a lot of time pressures all the time. And so we kind of get to the point. Um, that doesn't work in, in every, you know, situation. Uh, and so I've often learned that, especially working and, and talking with younger colleagues, um, if I have feedback, I'm wrapping it up in a big fat compliment sandwich. I'm really like laying on early on, um, you know, putting in the effort to check in with them before I even get to the point of my question. Um, you know, I think there is some value in being able to ask some questions um, and sharing a little bit about yourself and, and opening yourself up. And that goes to the humanity. Understanding that we are all complex individuals. We all have lives. We all have, um, you know, families and interests and joys and beings and making the time to understand that of somebody. Um, I think quite often the unhealthiest relationships that we have are with people who we don't really understand all that well. And so, you know, it's easy to say, I don't much want to understand that person. Um, but I think quite often when you do put in the effort to try to get to know them and understand what makes them tick and what motivates them, um, it's a lot easier to work more productively um, with that colleague. And, you know, for those of us who manage others, um, it's just integral to be able to understand the whole person. Um, they appreciate it. Um, the relationship is stronger as a result. Um, and, you know, research overwhelmingly shows that um, when a person has a close relationship with somebody at work, they're, they are far more productive. They're more likely to stay in the job. Uh, their mental health and physical health are stronger. Uh, and, and so, frankly, it's just good business to actually see the humanity and care about the people that you're working with. Um, so with that, I leave you with, um, you know, our signs and all of this stuff is on our website. Again, for you to explore, it's freely available, things that you can print out and share uh, with colleagues uh, around ways that we want to show up from the healthy side, um, being able to identify some unhealthy behaviors um, that creep into our relationships and lives. Um, and then lastly is uh, for those who have children, middle school through college, we have this great start that conversation guide. I'll throw it in the chat. We have a PDF of it. Um, if you register again through the website and go through the stuff, um, you can access it that way as well. Um, but it's conversation starters, um, really useful guide in terms of how do you use pop culture media how do you use dinner time conversations? How do you frame your your questions to the kiddos to get them talking about some of this stuff? Um, you know, real healthy relationships start at home, um, and you know, our kids are watching the relationships that we have and how we behave in our own relationships. Um, so it's incredibly helpful to um, engage them in what does it look like in general. Uh, and then finally, we want to just call out an opportunity. Um, so as a nonprofit, um, you know, we fundraise on the back end. So all we don't sell our programming uh, in any way. Uh, and so we have uh, a big event in May, uh, May 10th at the Envoy Hotel. Um, it's uh, One Night for One Love Boston. We have a great program of speakers. Um, 
we have some wonderful uh, sponsors and there's some opportunities for other corporate sponsors, lots of marketing benefits. Um, this workshop, a version of this workshop is one of the benefits as well uh, at a certain level. Um, but there's lots of interesting and really good marketing opportunities for businesses uh, who want to come in as sponsors. We have about 200 people who come to the event um, and it's a really nice evening uh, with folks who share our commitment uh, in creating a world of healthier relationships. Um, you can learn more on our website and uh, again, some of the sponsors, so Encore Boston Harbor is our presenting sponsor. Uh, they've been great uh, to us. Direct Federal, which I know is a member of the chamber, um, came on as a great sponsor. Uh, and CVS, um, which has many uh, branches in our the chamber's area as well. Uh, like I said, there's uh, many sponsorship opportunities that still exist. Um, and so if folks are interested, you can feel free to uh, reach out to me. Uh, and tickets are also available online as well. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to leave you. Do we have time for this? We have time for this. Um, I'll leave you with a short video. Um, and so Valentine's Day uh, a year or two ago, we did a pop up. So again, we use kind of media quite often to engage folks. Um, we did a counter pop up uh, to get people to talk about and think about healthy relationships. Uh, and so I'd love to share this. I feel like my heart hurts a little bit for people who think that that's what love is. Um, loving is hard and it's hard to know when you're not in a good relationship. I felt that it was insanely relatable. Every little emotion or feeling or urge, I felt all of them before. I used to be overweight, and when I saw like the chocolate, it triggered something in me. I actually had an ex who had. I find my iPhone password. More tips than I know. This experience was impactful because I believe that a lot of people do not know like what it is like to love. Like we're not taught how to love. I'm excited to go home and talk to my partner now. I think when we really listen to each other, we can love each other better. It's one of my favorite uh, videos that we've produced. It really was just, it's two days in New York City uh, a couple of uh, years ago. Um, and it really is the essence of what our mission is, which is to facilitate discussion about healthy relationships, primarily, you know, with young people, but as well as uh, the adults in their lives. And so whether that's teachers, coaches, um, religious leaders, parents, whomever um, really want to be able to help spread the message and to kind of teach the language, which will then facilitate the learning. Um, and that goes um, not just for them, but all of us, um, how we show up at work, how we show up at home. Um, and so I just really want to thank you all for taking the time of your day uh, to learn a little bit about One Love um, and how, uh, you know, we all can play a role
and creating uh, healthy relationships. Um, so I know we're just about out of time, um, but happy you know to take any questions that people have um, uh, about our work. Um, I could definitely include it in the post uh, event email for you, Jeff. But I want to say thank you again for presenting, and I'll send in, um, his contact information, the slide deck, and the video to everyone who registered. Um, but I hope everyone have a great day. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Bye.